Good afternoon, and welcome to Wednesday Afternoon Hymns and Organ. I've already been asked once why I'm so dressed up today. Uh, it is Memorial Day week. That's not why I'm wearing red, white, and blue, though. I'm wearing it in honor of Maxine Warren. We had her graveside service just a little while ago at Oakwood Cemetery. She was wearing a red dress at her request when she was interred. So I brought my red tie for today. So we're going to sing a number of very familiar hymns, and as usual, I hope that you will be singing with me. We do have some very talented, uh, we have an orchestra over here. We had violinists last week with Hadley Hines and Bryn Van Allsburg. Now we had cellists this week with William Bledsoe and Lauren Lyerly. Thank you for being here. They're playing on all of our hymns today. And after we finish singing hymns, Dr. Peter has some other special music with our guest musicians today, our very distinguished and talented guest musicians. So thank you all for being here. We are going to uh, pray. I do want to acknowledge again our research assistants for this week are Elizabeth Tracy and Russ Perkins. They saved me a lot of time and bring some great stories for these, these hymns as well. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, God, we thank you again for the incredible heritage of music and message that emerges from lives and stories and sometimes disasters of a personal or even national or continental or universal nature. And we thank you that out of those great times of trial come great enduring songs of faith. And we pray that you'll encourage those who listen and sing along today. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. We begin with a mighty fortress is our God. It is one of the most uh, best is one of the best loved and most widely known hymns by Martin Luther. And you may know that Martin Luther was a great pioneer in terms of hymn writing. Uh, the controversy between him and some of the other early reformers, including our own reformed branch with Ulrich Zwingli, was that they all thought you should just sing psalms, and Luther thought it was time to write some new church music. So this hymn, well-known hymn, is based on Psalm 46. We don't know exactly when it was written, but one source that I have has it written in 1527. The significance of that year is that on on April the 22nd, a dizzy spell forced Luther to stop preaching in the middle of his sermon as a fellow pastor. I can go, that would be traumatic. On July the 6th, as friends arrived for dinner, Luther felt an intense buzzing in his ear. He went to lie down and called out, water or I'll die. In August, the plague erupted in Wittenberg. Now think about that for a moment. What are we living with? Our version of the plague. And as fear spread, so did many of the townspeople. But Luther, as a pastor, thought it was his duty to stay in Wittenberg and to care for the sick. And even though his wife was pregnant, they invited uh, the sick, those suffering from their version of the coronavirus, into their home to take care of them at great risk and then eventually Luther's son became ill. And not until November did the plague begin to subside. In August, September, and December of that year, partly because of all this depression and illness, uh, plagued Luther's emotional life and spiritual life. And yet somehow during that year, he wrote these words we still sing based on Psalm 46, a mighty fortress is our God.
Eleanor Fargin was an English author of children's stories and plays, poetry, biography, history, and satire, but she suffered from ill health throughout her childhood. She was homeschooled, spent her convalescence in the attic, reading the books that surrounded her. The hymn, Morning Has Broken, was first published in 1931. It was inspired by the village of Alfriston in East Sussex. Eleanor Fargin was asked to write a poem to give thanks for every day and that would fit this, to, to, the traditional Scotic Gaelic tune, Bunesan. It is often sung in children's services and in funeral services. The song is often misattributed to the English pop musician and folk singer, Cat Stevens, who included a version of the song on his album in 1971. Eleanor Fargin's Morning Has Broken. Tim was written by an obscure, blind lay preacher who served in the hamlet of Coles Hill, Warwickshire, England. He owned a small trinket village in the shop where he sold shoehorns and other intricate items that he had whittled and fashioned and polished from bones. Walford memorized many chapters of the Bible. He quoted them verbatim in his sermons. Obviously, as a blind preacher, he couldn't actually read the text in front of him. Some people thought he had memorized the entire Bible. He also composed poems, and he prayed. And so the story goes that a minister and friend stopped by Walford's shop one day in 1842, and Walford asked this friend named Thomas Salmon to write down his new poem, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Three years later, that friend, Salmon, was in the U.S. and showed the poem to the editor of the New York Observer, who printed it in the paper September the 13th of 1845. But it would be 15 years after Walford's death before music was composed by William Bradbury from New York, and it became the familiar and well-loved song that we know, Sweet Hour of Prayer.
go from a couple of relatively obscure hymn writers to one of the best known whose hymns we've sung several times already in these hymns and organ series. This one was written by Charles Wesley, who along with his brother John were major players in the founding of Methodism. You may know that Charles was the youngest of 18 children, and he wrote over 9,000 religious poems, 6,000 of which became hymns. There are a couple of different tunes to this hymn, both Heifredal and Beecher. This one is Beecher, and this hymn is basically written around a lot of scripture and a series of thoughts, our prayers for the Holy Spirit to come and be among us, praying for the return of our Lord, the second coming, and prayers that his new creation would finally happen. So the prayers, uh, uh, the song is actually addressed to Jesus Christ and begins with a prayer that he might come and indwell our lives anew, to fix in us thy humble dwelling and let us all in thee inherit. But there's a tone of praise and adoration of Jesus that runs throughout the text and the final stanza is clearly a prayer that our lives would consistently display the purity and holiness of Jesus Christ. Pure and spotless, let us be changed from glory into glory. Love divine, all loves excelling.
So when I stumble over a word every once in a while, I think, well, you have the advantage of having them right in front of you on the screen, and that's thanks to Kathy Lyde. She has put together those PowerPoints for us each week, and I am incredibly grateful for that. The next hymn is uh, Ferris Lord Jesus. So we've sung already a couple uh, from those who are relatively obscure. The writer of this hymn is so obscure, we don't even know who he or she was. There are several different accounts of the origin of this hymn. One source says it came from Roman Catholic Jesuits uh, in Germany. Another, All of them have to do with Germany, but another is that it goes even further back to 12th century German crusaders as they went to the Holy Land. And you probably know enough history to know that there's a lot about the Crusades in the, in the late medieval ages that we're not particularly proud of. And yet there's also some amazing faith that comes out of that same era. Uh, it's a great uh, humble reminder for me that every generation gets some things wrong and some things right. But probably the most credible account is that this hymn was sung by the followers of John Huss. We talked about him last week with Diane Coleman's favorite hymn in the Moravian tradition. They were driven out of Bohemia in 1620 in an anti-Reformation purge. They had to keep their faith secret, yet they had a strong tradition of hymn singing. And the most reliable tradition says this hymn came from, from those very humble Christians who wouldn't have cared whether anybody ever knew that they wrote the hymn. But whoever wrote it was very close to nature. Uh, many people have commented that this spring things just seem more beautiful. And I was just out in our azalea garden. If you haven't been out back recently to see the Warlick Garden, you need to hop in your car sometime and just see how beautiful it is right now. But the, the writer of this hymn says there's something that's even more beautiful than the creation, and that's the Creator, our Lord Jesus Christ, fairest Lord Jesus.
number of you listening will know exactly what song we're going to sing, even if you weren't looking at the next title slide. When I tell you that it's Pastor Bob's favorite hymn, and when I die, you're going to sing it at my funeral. So that leads me to make a brief comment. My mother uh, in Suffolk, Virginia, watches all, the, all of our programs on Wednesday afternoons and on Sunday mornings, and she sent me a list of hymns to sing, and I'm saying, Mom, nobody knows those songs. Like, you and I know them, but other people don't. These are about favorite hymns. But it gave me an idea. So next Wednesday, we're going to hear favorite songs from my mother, my wife, and me, whether or not you know them. So it's the Thompson Favorite Week next Next week. If you want other hymns, suggest them for weeks beyond that. But I'm cheating a little bit by giving you my favorite hymn today, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It was written by Thomas Obadiah Chisholm, and a lot of hymns come out of a particular crisis. This hymn comes more out of his life. So he's born in Kentucky, very poor, lacked a formal education, but still became a, a teacher and a newspaper editor. And at age 27, he came to Christ, and he went on to become a Methodist minister. But he served a church for less than a year before having to leave the ministry due to ill health, a condition that plagued him the rest of his life. And he found his way finally to New Jersey, where in order to support himself, he sold insurance. So he was a man of scripture, and many of these hymns are deeply rooted in scripture. And his passage was Lamentations chapter 3, Verses 22 and 23, because of the Lord's love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So Lamentations is an extension of the book of Jeremiah, and it's really a very sad book, except for this bright light of hope that's right in the middle of chapter 3. Uh, Great is thy faithfulness by Thomas Obadiah Chisholm.
song can still send chills up and down my spine. I love that. We're going to close with Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. So this song, uh, based on 1 John chapter 2, verse 10, whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there is nothing in him to make him stumble, was written by John Fawcett in 1782. At the age of 26, John Fawcett and his new bride, Mary, began their ministry at a really tiny little impoverished Baptist church in Waynesgate, England. But after seven years of distinguished service, uh, Fawcett got some notice from the wider church, and he got a call to a bigger and richer and more influential church, and he accepted the call. The wagons were loaded. Uh, for the move, this story actually moves me, and the Fawcett's met their tearful parishioners for a final farewell. And Mary turned to John and she said, John, I can't bear to go. I don't know how we can leave. And he said, I can't either. We're staying here. And the order was then given to unload the wagons. So Mary Fawcett turned to the congregation and she said, we cannot break the ties of affection that bind us to you, dear friends. As a pastor, I know what it means to be so deeply connected to the people that you serve. And John stayed there for 54 years in ministry. And the Sunday after the almost move, he preached from Luke chapter 12, verse 15, a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things he possesses. And he wrote a poem for that week that he titled Brotherly Love, and we call it Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. His salary was estimated never to exceed $200 a year. Despite his growing reputation as a powerful preacher, he loved his people most of all. Blessed be the tie that binds. Father of all grace, creator of all things, we have sung of your incredible work that we see in the world around us. 
Lord Jesus, we have sung of your grace on the cross and our hope through you. And Holy Spirit, we have sung about the comfort and strength that you give. And my mind as we sing this final song goes to people right now that I know who are hurting. That are hurting because they're ill. That are hurting because they've lost a dear loved one. That are hurting because of relationships that have been broken. That are hurting because they're lonely and isolated. That are hurting because they're afraid. And I pray that somehow you would take these songs and especially the scriptures on which they are um, crafted. And I pray that you would encourage and bless and strengthen your people during these difficult days. May we sense the presence of the Holy Spirit, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll turn it over to Dr. Peter now and his talented cohort here. There will be a couple of uh, pieces uh, where the, the strings don't play first. The first one kind of follows along with what Bob was talking about and was a request by somebody who's uh, been pretty ill. And uh, one of uh, his real favorite pieces I asked was his eyes on the sparrow. So I'd like to go ahead and play that uh, for him. And uh, it's just a piece of great calm and great comfort. The next piece really is of a great joyous piece. And uh, there are people lately, there's several people I know who've had birthdays, maybe even today or a few days ago. Uh, but my son just turned 22 on Monday. So I'd like to do a little version of happy birthday for my son Shane. And uh, then we'll move on to the last two pieces with the strings. So a little happy birthday.
Last two tunes. Uh, now we will have uh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, which is also a special request uh, of comfort to a family today. And we'd like to do that with our string quartet. What a friend. And the last tune uh, was a request. Actually, someone really wanted it on Sunday. And so I said, oh, wow, you know, I need to just go ahead and have the strings play with me, and we'll do this uh, special piece. Uh, it kind of follows up on Memorial Day, and uh, it's all about how God is with us in the watchfires, in the camps, in the good, the bad, the difficult, and we will prevail. With God's help, the battle hymn of the Republic. Mm -hmm. 